Good evening. I am Luke Conco. I'm a trustee here at the Library Society. And normally, I'm enjoying sitting where you're sitting and listening to Ann Cleveland make these kind of introductions. But tonight, I agreed to uh, introduce Adam Gettle, our speaker for tonight, uh, as he's been a good friend of mine for 44 years. And uh, um, he graciously offered to come speak tonight. Uh, he is a Tony Award-winning composer uh, whose musicals have been performed in New York, London, and elsewhere around the world. Uh, some of his shows you might be familiar with include Light in the Piazza, uh, Floyd Collins, Saturn Returns, Days of Wine and Roses, Millions, and, and others. Uh, he is the grandson of Broadway legend Richard Rogers, uh, of Rodgers and Hammerstein, who wrote and produced such classics as Oklahoma, South Pacific, The King and I, uh, Carousel, and The Sound of Music. Um, Adam's also the son of Mary Rogers Gettle, who um, was one of the early women writers in musical theater in the 50s and, and 60s, and wrote uh, Once Upon a Mattress, and also the book, and then later several screenplays for Freaky Friday. So he uh, he comes from he comes from it genetically. <laughs> uh, and uh, her memoir, Adam's mother, uh, Mary is, is no longer with us, but her her memoir, Shy, that she co-authored with the New York Times theater critic Jesse Green, is currently on the New York Times bestseller list. And Adam agreed to come speak about his mother's book and his grandfather and um, his family's uh, indelible uh, impact and, and legacy on, on uh, entertainment and, and uh, musicals. So, uh, and it's, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the Library Society was founded in 1748. It is the <laughs> second oldest cultural cultural institution in the South, and it is, sorry, the oldest cultural institution in the South, and it is the second oldest circulating library in America. It's an A. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's special for me because I met Adam as a 14-year-old ninth grader on the fourth floor of a New England boarding school dormitory. We were a couple hall, uh, rooms away from each other. Uh, he was a precocious, sophisticated uh, young man who'd grown up on Central Park West in Manhattan with um, uh, entertainment industry and society figures coming in and out of his family living room. Uh, I was from the woods outside a small city. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about his family or uh, the music industry, least of all Broadway. But um, I knew that I wanted to be friends with this person who was very smart, kind, funny, irreverent, always looking at the lighter side of things, always telling funny stories, always trying to get other people to laugh. And, and he had always had a mischievous twinkle in his eye. And I said he would fit right in here in Charleston. <laughs> so, so uh, and uh, let's see. But. He was dead serious about music. Adam uh, spent probably five hours a day in the music building when we were, when we were 14. And uh, that was frustrating to me because I was a sports obsessed jock and Adam was a great runner and really could have run varsity track or cross country as a freshman at our school. And I kept bugging him to go out for the team and he just couldn't be bothered. He said, I'm gonna, gonna be over here in the music building and." I guess it's worked out. I guess it's worked out okay for him. Uh, let's see. What else can I tell you? Adam was a boy soprano soloist at the New York Metropolitan Opera growing up. And he also happened to be one of those people with a photographic memory and studied at Yale. So um, it, 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 special, special gifts. And um, I guess the... The, the, the most special thing I can say about Adam is he's, he's the only person I knew who grew up to be what he dreamed of being as a 14-year-old. And that is a, a talented composer who's, who's built, building his own musical legacy. 
And uh, with that, I just want to introduce Adam Gettle and, and Ann and let them uh, have a chat. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Lou. Um, 
Um, my, my mom did have a fairly full plate. There was lots on, on the menu there. Uh, she knew from a very young age that he was a wonderful composer and a wonderful artist. She, she loved music and she understood music, I think from a very young age, and started to try to make music from a very young, uh, young age. And as she began to attend his musicals, I think she understood the larger uh, consequence and import of what he was able to do what, out of nothing. He would go to the piano in the morning for a relatively short time compared to what we think of composers doing, sort of, you know, sweating and, you know, pulling out their hair and drinking and, you know, uh, uh, you know, losing their hearing or, you know, and you would just write a song in, you know, 45 minutes or an hour and a half um, and uh, be done for the day. Um, and she, she really admired that part of my grandfather, and that never changed, it only grew. And um, he was a very distant man. Um, he really was only interested in his work. He and my grandmother had a mutually Faustian bargain. Perhaps Faust did show up at one point, and then it, the three of them came to terms. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure how it worked. Um, my grandmother really wanted to be with an important man. I think she had a sense, and I think even her father warned her that he was not going to be faithful. I think they pro he probably put it in more delicate terms, but um, the point was made. I think she, she uh, decided to marry him anyway. Um, my grandfather knew that my grandmother wasn't the most dynamic woman, but very bright and very beautiful and would be responsible. And this is, we have to remember that late 20s and, well, really the, just the turn of 19, 30, really, I think, when they got married. And uh, his, I suppose, we would compromise uh, was that she wasn't, a, for him, a compelling partner, but she was a correct partner. And this was the union. And uh, it created an atmosphere that was, um, before, not before long, probably a little stony and a little bit um, sort of doctrinaire. Um, they didn't have lots of help and all of that. At the, at the beginning, um, uh, he would be awake for lots of time going to California to write movie scores and be abused by Hollywood types, which of course is a great tradition which continues to this day, um, <laughs> um, which I have, I have uh, you know, sampled myself. And, uh, um, you know, it was just uh, as you might expect. And uh, he did lots of, um, you know, wolfing around, and she took that and drove it underneath, and as Leibov's emotion or want to do, it came out sort of at my mother and, and her sister. So uh, my mother was um, subject to a very strict upbringing from which she wanted to flee at the earliest po possible opportunity. Uh, and, and so that brings us, you know, I, I think, uh, um, on the express to her first marriage, which was to a, a, a very handsome, very Mayflowery, and not to discount that, I'm sure there are probably most of you are related to Mayflower people, a very handsome Mayflower guy <laughs> named uh, um, uh, Gerald B. And, uh, and they, but he was, he was gay. In the 50s, um, you know, the amount of emotional energy uh, in being closeted in New York at a very high end sort of white shoe law firm was um, immense. And then that, he took that out on her, and it was really rough. So I've gone on a bit. I don't know if I've no, gone no, no. on. Uh, so that's how, that is what fomented that background, an immense admiration for art and art making, and she had developed her own significant talent by then, and really wanted to express it. And uh, she's in this environment with three young kids at the age of 24, she had three kids. Um, you don't see that a lot these days, and uh, um, um, and he was dragging her across the room by her hair and stuff. He, you know, he was absolutely so confused within himself. Um, in those days, it was really, um, I think, a kind of torture um, for somebody to be conflicted about that and not be able to release uh, that energy. And uh, she divorced uh, from Jerry, um, I think, by somewhere around maybe 1956.
not sure what the data is exactly. And then we'll help. help. <clears throat> um, the title of her book is Shy. Yeah. You read this book, and it's hard to apply that <laughs> to Mary Rogers. Get it? I mean. You do realize this is ironic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, she. One of the things that she admitted was that she excused her father, but she whined about her mother, which I found interesting. I mean, she had serious difficulties with her mother. It, well, I wouldn't say she excused her father, but she um, essentially wrote him off. I mean, there wasn't a continuous uh, and active account with her father because he was how he was and not even that much participant. Her relationship with her mother was an ongoing source of uh, uh, self-questioning and often self-loathing and, uh, and irritation and, and defiance. And then that leads me to something that's very important about my mom, which is that she really dined out on being a sort of minor heiress um, um, and daughter of a very prominent figure in American culture who said lots of colorful words <clears throat> and, uh, and was known for that sort of shocking thing of being, you know, someone who uh, would, many, many people in that circumstance would be uh, quite, quite withheld and keep their hard to vest and things like that. And she was, she was known for just being um, sort of a, a little closer or, or to the Tallulah Bankhead than the um, uh, than the Grace Kelly, certainly. And um, she also wasn't a great beauty, although. Um, and when she was growing up with my grandmother, who was very thin and lithe and impeccably dressed in silks and satins and you know chandelier um, and things like that, my mom was not as my grandmother would have her, and so she carried with her a sense of being a, a bit of a, you know, um, a, a, you know, an ox almost, and, uh, and that got her into um, a speed, which is in the book, so I'm not going to, those of you who have read it, um, um, may want a little extra detail and color, which I'm very happy to provide. Um, and so in the 50s, um, Mom was spending um, 15, is it okay to go in? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, people, well, you have drugs. Um, sorry? That's why you're here. Oh, okay, good. Um, um, right, um, Lou said it's okay to talk about alcohol. Um, uh, <laughs> you said in Charleston that's a good topic. Um, um, but in fifth she was spending $1,500 a month on illegal speed to keep herself going with all these children and this, all this work. And she would complain to anyone who would listen that she had no help and she had no money. Um, but when you think about what fifteen hundred dollars a month was in 1956, somewhere in the fifteen thousand to seventeen thousand dollar range. And um, wow, that's uh, well, she uh, she did have some money, but it was going to just keeping her going. And um, um, there's there's been a lot of interest in the book from Hollywood and stuff. And when I have these meetings with Netflix and HBO and things, I just say, uh, we must, to make it interesting, and mom would agree, she wasn't just this um, incredibly energetic person um, who was very generous in many ways and wonderful, because she was all those things. She was extraordinary and incredibly funny and smart. But she also was, um, she was running on vapors, and um, in the household, uh, that was just, that could turn into a sort of Vesuvian anger. Um, and then, when she finally found, when she finally landed on the tarmac of Prozac, um, you know, just gently, <laughs> just came in for a Prozac landing. Um, the help that we had in the household, I remember being in the kitchen with them once, and we all just said, Prozac. <laughs> And uh, it's just a complete turnaround, and she was just an angel out of that. This is the greatest thing. Um, um, 
go, well, when did, when did the Prozac come in? Was, I don't know, it was, it was 30 years ago, so it was a big, big change. Um, one of the quotes that I'm going to read that I took to heart, I, I think most women will, um, what affected me most was that loneliness and time, this is about her having read a member of the wedding. She said, what affected me most was the loneliness and tomboy anger of Frankie. She was one pissed off little character, let out, bossed around, left out, pat, bossed around, passionate in a world determined to crush oddballs. I never thought of her connection to me because the details were so different based as they were on the color zone childhood in Georgia. But part of the reason I have always been drawn to writing about kids and to having them too is that I knew that feeling all too well. Um, can you speak to how that motivated her with her talents? Yes. Um, she carried with her um, a glorious um, um, maternal quality that was also laced with a kind of defiance. So she raised us with a very free hand, but also um, a tight hug. Um, she was, I can still remember the sound of her voice through her chest um, when I was a very, very little boy, when she would sort of clutch me up and, and I would lie on her, um, with my ear to her chest and she would speak. And when you, if you can think of that, all of us when we were little, you hear your mother's voice through their chest. Um, it, it's just that, mm, 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 mm. and if you think about it, that's what our mothers would have sounded like when we were in the womb. Um, it's about as close as we can get. And um, her, her maternal warmth, I think, is also in her music, but it was also um, wonderfully, uh, she was very, uh, she was not a helicopter mom at all. I mean, I was on the number six bus going across Central <laughs> Park at the age of seven. There was nobody with me. She just gave me the token and then, you know, go see Whitney. Whitney had a, a fountain in his house, by the way. Um, and uh, and uh, it was like that in those days. So she was a great mom and didn't, um, she wasn't, she wasn't uh, trying to make us into little carbon copies of anything. Um, she was very, I think she, I think both my parents were entirely shocked that I, that I didn't turn out to be gay. I think I had to come out as a straight guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, what were some of the, some of how she, her um, attraction to caring about children, how did she take that professionally? Well, um, well, you said that one, I want to make sure I, it's one more Well, time. I mean, her, her first Broadway hit was Once Upon a Mattress, which is based on a children's story. Yes. And then Freaky Friday, I mean, she, she did. It's, it's, it's true, and um, th that's, there's a lot of shade in there. But, but yes, she, she felt very comfortable in that milieu. In fact, before Mattress, she wrote a lot of children's songs, which were quite good. And she really grokked. She also wrote a children's book called The Rotten Book with a very, uh, very well-known children's book author who's named Stephen Kellogg, whose books may be represented somewhere in the, in the stacks here. Um, and uh, yes, and that could have to do with the sort of um, barometric pressure of having a father like Richard Rogers, who, who uh, you know, didn't write for children most decidedly. Um, and she felt that she needed to establish her own kind of imprimatur in another realm. That could be part of it. Um, she, was, she was certainly someone who always maintained a, a real um, folksy and organic touch with um, the voice of a younger person. Uh, and um, some people lose that. They just can't remember how that sounds. And, and, and how a person who's much younger would, would express him or herself. Um, um, more Freaky Friday and Billions of Bars than, than Mattress, which can be seen as a, a bit of a romp and uh, 
it's not it's not actually written as a children's uh, story. It's, it was a success on Broadway for for people of all ages. So. Another thing that struck me about the book is how much time she sought escape to the Catskills or anywhere other than New York City, which is was essential to her life. But a lot of it sounded like you were at camp a lot in, in the sense that your house was like going to camp. Is that correct? Well, the house wasn't, uh, but I wasn't camp a lot. I, mean, I started at the age of seven for two month sleepaway camps. What what it was like then? And I thought it was great because there were girls there. <laughs> and all these other kids would be like, oh, I miss my parents. I was like, what is the matter with you? <laughs> uh, and, uh, but you know, that's how it started. And then camp, and then after eighth grade, off to boarding school. Um, but mom, mom would go to our house. Um, for six weeks or two months and not come home to write books and get them finished because she really needed the, the, the solitude. And uh, we just got used to it. Dad would be there um, and uh, then she'd come back. And I remember um, when she finished Freaky Friday, we were in one of those, I don't think we could, they have them anymore, but you know those Econoline vans from back then where a big part of the motor was in the front there to the right of the, 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 the driver. It was like a big kind of um, block there covered in plastic or something where a lot of the motor was, and then there would be the passenger seat. And she sat on that thing and turned, you know, facing my brother and me, we were in the back seat. She read the entire manuscript on onion skin paper as we went somewhere really far away, I don't know where, long enough far away enough to, to, to hear the whole book. Um, she needed her, her um, she took her work very seriously, and we all did too. And uh, we, she, we needed, um, she needed to bring in the, the income as well. You know, she was, she was really the, the prime mover and shaker, and she was very disciplined. Well, there certainly comes across in the book that there were two other than you incredibly important men in her life. And one was Stephen Sondheim, who she known growing up, and they maintained a remarkable um, closeness. When Sondheim was trying to write company, he said he had no experience with marriage and wanted to sort of talk to Mary. Um, I told him that even a good marriage is not always great which is something I would still say to someone, that to make up for the rough patches, you have to be both challenged and entertained, so you need a spouse who's both smart and funny, that if you find that combination, you better stick with it, because everything else will eventually wear off. That if the big things are right, the fights will mostly be over small things. That compromise is essential, because marriage itself is a compromise, being trapped and not wanting to let go. Um, I took away that she actually contemplated having already born three children with a gay husband, uh, marrying him so that they both have some stability in their lives. Is that true? Yes, he wanted to. I'm sorry, he wanted to. Um, appear to society as, as uh, his, uh, his society would have him appear, and she wanted to get the hell out of her parents' house. Um, she, she was in her last semester at Wellesley um, and got married, so graduated. Um, and later, much later in life, she, she was a lifelong um, wonk about medicine. She got the uh, New World Medical Review and the Harvard Review of Medicine, and she had every edition of the Merck Manual, the PDR, shelves and shelves. And if you called it with the slightest complaint, you'd be like, wait one second. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, she goes, well, you obviously have a, um, you know, a gastro whoozy bopper, and what you need to do is this and that, and you need to stay away from acid, and, you know. She was just amazing. It was always what she said. Um, uh, what was that? What was all that? 
Sansa, no, why am I saying she, oh, oh, so she, uh, she, uh, she quit Wellesley, uh, just, you know, half a semester shy of graduating, and then, um, much later in life, she thought, I want to go to medical, medical school. It was, it was when she got very depressed about writing music and she decided not to do it anymore, and, um, she thought she would apply to medical school, and she got quite far down that road, and, um, and to talk to people, and I think even got some applications, and you know, and then she was very disappointed to learn that she had to graduate from college before she. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, she, she was a little bit uh, scattered at that point. So, uh, she had, maybe she hadn't quite found the Prozac yet. I'm not sure. Well, fortunately, she did meet your dad. Oh yes, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I jumped in. Yeah. Well. So I had to get through the amazingly close friendship. I think he learned a great deal from her, and he, she learned a great deal from him, and just had him on a pedestal. My dad? My dad? Yes. They really loved each other, and they really laughed a lot, and they loved to go on vacation, and they, they had a, a really good time together. Uh, but she still felt that there was a financial burden on her? I think so. I mean, uh, my father got, um, unfortunately, sort of bamboozled by a very famous conductor named Sarah Caldwell, who took him for everything he had, which was a substantial sum, and then, and then they had nothing, and my grandfather uh, paid off the debt and then hired my, grand, my father to work for him for a while, which was sort of a, an ignominious, you know, passive way for, for everyone. <laughs> Um, but, you know, they all came through it. And my father found a wonderful pathway in his career and ended up being a really successful um, executive in the movie business. Um, so that, that all worked out fine. And I gather he handled taking on her previous three children. He was terrific, terrific about it. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it wasn't exactly the Brady Bunch, but it was, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Your older brother, Matthew, who suffered from asthma, and they called it croup, um, would reach the point where she moved the family to Maryworld? Maryworld, yes. It's sort of a quaint um, adjustment to Maryworld. Which and was sort of like, again, family camp. But yes, it was a theater enclave in the Catskills, um, uh, where George Abbott was originally founded by uh, um, Henry George, the uh, single tax theorist, and uh, I think the grandfather of Agnes Mill, famous choreographer, and it had become a theater enclave. And so George Abbott was there, and Cal Burnett would come up, and lots of famous actors, and it was sort of wonderful. And um, I spent all my childhood going there. It was really, really great. You know, the lake and the clubhouse, etc. Um, in the early years, it was, it was Matthew. We had a, a really falling down Victorian house. Um, and Matthew had very bad asthma, but they didn't know a lot about it then. And one night he walked into my mother's room, barely able to breathe, and he collapsed uh, and, uh, in her arms. He just sort of turned blue and he died in her arms. Um, and she never really was able to uh, talk about it. She was not a, um, a big. Um, demonstrator of, uh, of emotion in that way. She was a wonderfully emotional writer, and, um, and I think the way she demonstrated emotion was through generosity uh, toward others. And sometimes um, one of the most eviscerated tempers that you could possibly imagine. Uh, but, um, you know, she, everyone has a right to that sometimes. So this is not one of those mommy dearest things. <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> People um, deal with love and grief in very different ways, and um, it broke my heart when I read it. She said, people seem and have seemed ever since dissatisfied with my grief over Matthew's death and my management of my kids. This what, is not true. Yeah, what comes through in the book is that she was an incredibly loving, supportive mother yeah. who wanted you all to be so independent. At one point, she brags about 
thinking that all of her kids should know everything about sex, so she gave you all the Kama Sutra. That's not true. <laughs> These things happen. Can I, speak, can I speak to the the actual form of memoirs for a brief second? That's what I was leading up to. Um, memoirs are tricky because they're often written by people who are too old to be writing memoirs. And, um, memoirs should be written by people when they're in the fullness of their mind, in the sense of that id. It's, you know, let's just dabble in a little young here. They have their id and they have their super ego, which manages the id. And when people are super duper old, the super ego is sort of burned off, and this is very roughly speaking. But um, my mother was plied with white wine at 11.30 when Jesse arrived, ate two bites of lunch, he stayed there till 2.30, and I think she went through well more than a bottle of white wine. Um, I cannot drink that wine to this day. And, um, you know, and when she says things like, that, which I'm sure she said, it's just not true. Um, uh, you know, people gave her all the sympathy in the world, even though she couldn't speak about it. I mean, for that fact, one would feel sympathy for her. Uh, that she uh, lost a child in her arms, who died in her arms, and no one supposed that she didn't love that child with all of her heart. And, um, and, and, and it certainly almost absurd to me to think that people would draw some connection uh, from that event to her not loving her other children. It's just all sort of um, super ego-free, uh, white wine addled um, keeper birds. Uh. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> I will say she did months old had suddenly turned into a clown, while the adults and older kids were glumming through some form of dinner, dinner in the great big living room, he came downstairs in his Dr. Denton's and suddenly started entertaining us. Previously in his short life, at 20, less than two years old, yeah, short life, he hadn't done much or said much. <laughs> He'd been picky and morose. But now he became a complete extrovert, singing and dancing and laughing. Well, I don't remember the event, but uh, uh, but I don't I don't doubt it. I mean, I think simply conceived it would have been well, um, you know, bullshit, 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 my turn or something like that. I mean, not to be macabre, but you know, that's how it is with siblings, I suppose. But I do remember Matthew. Um, as my first friend, and um, I also named my um, hat for my entire adult life, named my music company Matthew Music, and um, I have a, a box full of things that are about him, including a beautiful porcelain doll that I found just in the woods, right in the back of the house where Matthew died, where I spent my childhood, and the arms and legs are, you know, chipped off, but it's a beautiful angel porcelain that still has the sort of rouge on the porcelain face of this lovely angel and the sort of angelic curly hair. And uh, I found it when I was six, and I still have it, and I look at it all the time. He's a very, and I've drunk about him, and he talked in the dream. He said, oh gosh, how are you doing? He said, I'm a writer now. And I said, oh wow. I said, oh, I write music. He goes, I know. And he's, he's a very, you know, Big part of my life, and uh, you know these things. That's how. That's how these things are. Um, the other comment is that you are, other than the reference to Matthew, essentially the only child your mom talked much about in the memoir. And do you think that's because you have succeeded outstandingly in a field? that she cared so much about, which was music and theater and writing. Well, I would say that, that that fact is largely true. It was uncomfortable for me when I was reading Gallus, and uh, my, my brothers and sisters are incredibly gracious and, and have been about that uh, for my whole life. As I got into music really early and sang professionally as a 
boy soprano when I was a kid and got an inordinate amount of attention from my mom mostly, which not only put my sisters and brothers in, a, in an uncomfortable position, which they handled beautifully, but also really did not please my father. He, he, uh, it was just so, then there was a lot of stuff from him, and it was, you know, and uh, so, uh, yes, I mean, it was the music stuff mostly. Um, and, you know, it's, it's some, I'm, I'm grateful for it in the sense that what mom gave to me and my brothers and sisters is really the, the core of what her special generosity was. You know, she was a minor philanthropist, and, and, and giving away money is, is a very important thing, a very fine, very fine thing to do. Um, and in most cases, it's not a reflexive or self-seeking thing. It's a beautiful thing to do. But what mom had all her life, well before she had any money to give away, was the ability to have a young artist come into the house for lunch and meet Mary Rogers, someone she had heard play, someone whose music she had heard, um, someone who wanted to meet her, who liked her work, who loved her writing, who loved her musical, whatever, and she would serve lunch for dinner, and, and she would somehow um, put an ember, somehow be able to bring an ember into that person's heart, um, which, which that they would leave with, which, and they knew that Mary Rogers understood them, really believed in their talent, and that they pursued it and applied themselves, that they could, they could make, that they really had something, that they had an individual and organic talent, that she saw it, and if she saw it, then it was real. And she did that for her kids, and she did that for many, many hundreds of young artists. Um, right through her, when she was the chair of Juilliard, um, she chaired for, I guess, eight, or eight years or so. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, and, uh, and, and when, even before that, um, when she was uh, on the board of Exeter, and, and uh, all kinds of things, she always did that. And people don't know that about her. And in fact, the book doesn't talk about that either, which is, you know, uh, what gives me a chance to say it here. Um, at the same time, one of the things you told me, which stunned me, because I have no musical talent. But, you know, every musician needs somebody who is an appreciative member of an audience. And I can't get through a day without music. I mean, it's, the first thing I did was to get a piano in here. I play music all day long. You said that you never had music playing in the house. I mean, I had music from the minute I get to my desk till I go home. Yeah, she hated music in the house, hated it. <laughs> uh, it was like, it was like um, the Von Trapp household before Maria. <laughs> uh, 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 because she, had, by the time I sort of popped into cognizance, and also I was learning roles for, as a boy soprano, it was always headphones. Turn that down, turn it off, just turn it off, or use headphones, I can't, because she was writing. Uh, books then, or, or magazines, or all kinds of things like that, or screenplays, could not hear a note of music. It was, it was a, a sonically barren landscape. That just me since you turned out, of course, you were having your own music in your life at that point. Yes, but it wasn't something I could, I mean, if I was going to play piano, she would come and listen to what I'd written, and incidentally, she was my most important teacher, because she was also my most, uh, you know, uh, you know what she thought mattered enormously to me, and um, I would write. This is my twelve or thirteen or fourteen. You call that a melody, and I'd be like, well, I yes, um, and that's not a melody. That's just you're just draping something over the chords, and the chords aren't so good either. And uh, um, you know, you know, you learn when when you know the, the person you love most in the world is speaking to you that way, and. Um, you know, that's not good at all, start again, no. And then, um, uh, you know, those, what are you doing, harmonically, what, you're just leaving me hanging, that's, just, that's so unsatisfying, just start again, you know. Um, we have to come home, if you don't come home, you better, you know, you're setting an expectation here, you have to set it up and then, and then deliver, deliver a surprise that's even better, and, you know, all those fundamental things about, they're really rhetorical things, rhetorical issues, and you use the, the very, the very tools of music. You know, these are these are much deeper than music or lyrics. These are 
underneath all of that, fundamental tools of um, messaging and, and storytelling and narrative you know, that, that she started me off with. I learned more technical things later, but, you know, and it was basically the sort of Damocles was her love. You know, if you, if you can continue to be not very talented, I'm going to probably sort of not very much love you. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, in doing my research, um, I watched a fabulous interview you did with Stephen Sondheim. <clears throat> he asked him when he recognized in his own life that he knew he had his own voice. How about you? Well, one forgets, and that's probably a good thing. You, know, you, you have days when you go like a, you know, I'm a frog, and, and uh, that's that's good. That's healthy. You know? Um, I really don't know if I ever sort of. I, it's fair. I can't. Uh, but I will say one thing. I had a dream once about my. I had a dream once about my grandfather, and uh, we were in that that municipal that courthouse on Center Street in New York where you have to go for jury duty. And um, the dream was, I, uh, I walked into the, that incredible lobby, the super high ceilings, um, and my grandfather was there with a couple other proper, you know, kind of business looking guys. He always wore a suit, he was always perfectly, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the handkerchief here, he was perfectly dressed all the time. And he's walking briskly toward the bank of elevators there, so up the steps in the building, Grandpa's going like this with a couple of people flanking him, and I'm kind of scooting along next to him. Grandma, Grandma, it's Adam. And he goes, hey, oh, hey, hey, you yeah. know. And uh, I said, and he's going to the elevator, so he's almost there. I said, do you think I'm any good? And he gets into the elevator, and the doors are closing, and he goes, well, you have your own voice. Keep calling me. And, uh, and I was like, well, oh, great dream. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to leave enough time for people to ask questions. Um, I grew up, was born at Yale, grew up with Yale singing groups. What, did you sing in a singing group at Yale? I didn't. I tried to write a song for the Whiff and Hoofs. Um, they did not accept it. <laughs> well, uh, that's the black mark against the Whiffs. <laughs> They're wonderful. Um, now, I'm just going to, anybody, uh, I have more questions, but I'm going to share Adam with you. Does anybody have questions? Yes. Adam, uh, first of all, it's just an honor to be here. You have a family so part of our culture and our history. I'll share with you that my, my parents' first date was Oklahoma. <laughs> and uh, I, mean, I have an only child when I'm in the New York area. I, I went to new Broadway shows. I can't count how blessed I was at that opportunity. My question, though, is today, uh, you know, you sort of look at Gilbert and Sullivan as sort of an art form from another age. And Steve Spahn just passed away, if you all know. And putting Lynn Manuel Miami aside for a second, Andrew Ledwood was a septuagenarian. If Roger and Ed Hammerstein came out today and started writing, would there be an audience? Well, there are a couple ways to parse that or, or, or answer it. The, the, um, and, and actually, Roger Hammerstein and Lynn Manuel are very similar in this respect. They were accurately and very insightfully writing um, a, a cultural wave. So uh, Roger Hammerstein came into um, their own right after World War II. Uh, uh, actually, Oklahoma was 1943, but um, the same idea applies that um, America was, um, had every reason to be proud of itself, um, and especially when we implemented the Marshall Plan, and there, there wasn't a lot of um, uh, a cynicism about it, and, uh, um, you know, if you were to go into Europe uh, up until maybe even 1960, you know, you would be, Americans were considered uh, pretty okay. Um, uh, and, um, and they were writing into that, and to, um, to, uh, to write about things like miscegenation, which is South Pacific, or to, um, or even to write about a brand new state, um, uh, and to delve into, as they do in Oklahoma, I mean, the, the character of Judd, who's sort of considered the sort of bad guy, one of the best, theory, one of the best songs ever 
um, written for the theaters for the bad guy, one of the most layered and fascinating songs ever written, um, is for the villain. Uh, you know, they were doing really complicated things, but the larger point that I'd like to make, I hope, um, quickly here, is that they were very aware of the sort of social moment. Um, and and uh, so in the case of King and I, it was a woman who was, as, as Anne mentioned before, um, subjugated by society and fights against that um, and, uh, and, and changes the microcosm that she's in. And you know that the the, uh, the specific is the universal there. So Lin Manuel also correctly assessed and insightfully assessed where we are in this moment, and he took uh, the uh, family fathers and uh, and uh, mixed it up um, 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 in terms of casting it all differently and setting it to rap music, and um, had one of the largest hits ever. In the musical theater, I think in that respect they're very, very similar. Um, would they be successful now if Roger from Hammerstein were writing exactly, if a, a new team called something else were writing exactly the, kind, the way that they wrote then? I don't think so, um, um, because the idiom uh, of musical theater, um, um, of course, um, has to evolve and, and, and take on. Um, take on the world in, in, in which it exists. But, but I, I do believe in the form, and by that I mean um, opera is a three composed form, and so one doesn't have to make way for a compressed thing, which is an aria or a song, after speech, which is uncompressed, prosaic. Um, and so that form is very, very effective at creating velocity. We have spoken words which are very efficient at exposition, at getting facts and figures out, and then songs are incredibly moving and like silver in the pocket for metaphor. And people can take those home like silver in the pocket. And the form is, is it, it has an incredible accretive potential. Um, and it's a great form, and I believe in it. I've given my life to it. I didn't want to. It was the last thing I wanted to do, but I'm doing it anyway. It's idiotic. But, but, uh, but I really believe in the form, and I think that there, there's a Rodgers and Hammerstein out there somewhere, um, and they're just not going to write exactly as they do. Yes. Yes. 
your mom refers uh, uh, or suggests in a very business or factual way, um, not just maternal, that you're a genius. And if you recall, if it's not the 59th Street Bridge song, what's your first musical memory or your favorite? I was going to ask that. Um, I, I, do, I did love the 59th Street Bridge song. I was like just singing at the top of my lungs coming home from a, 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 a stroll in the park in my pram or whatever. And I also just had an operation on my right eye. I had lots of golden curls and I was wearing pink glasses to correct my vision. And, um, and I'd be singing the 59th Street Bridge song and these people would stop and say, Oh, poor thing, she blind. <laughs> Um, so that was my first favorite song, but my first favorite experience in the theater was that same year. There was a revival of Oklahoma at the then very new um, uh, Lincoln Center at State Theater. And my mom took me, and I started asking her fairly early on, when's it going to be over? And finally she said, you hate this so much that you want to be over. And I said, no, I love it so much, I don't want to end. And I, 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 she, I, she took me back for like two or three more performances. I just thought it was the most incredibly great thing I'd, I'd ever seen. I still do. When I went to London and saw Hugh Jackman do it, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I leapt to my feet at the end. It was just the most incredible thing. And then this very stuffy Brit tugged on my sport coat and said, we don't do that here. <laughs> 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 yes. I have to ask this. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the difference uh, in the music that your grandfather wrote between uh, Lorenz Hart and Oscar Hammerstein, because they're very different. They are. That's a great question. Um, uh, Larry, Larry was absolutely fascinating. Um, heartbreaking, lovely lyricist, but also um, um, sexy, athletic, um, an entire panoply of things that Hammerstein didn't have. And Hammerstein had a, a great kind of spectrum of lyricism and long lines. Um, Hammerstein's lyrics of uh, would uh, they tended to suggest longer notes. The ideas were more operatic. Um, and you know, people ask um, all, all the time, what's the difference between musicals and opera? And there's lots of different answers to that, and people are often asked, and they give lots of different answers. My answer is, it has to do with actually the practical thing of the size of the houses that these stories are put into. Musicals are generally in smaller spaces, and so, um, and they're now uh, amplified, but that didn't always used to be the case. But more importantly, they're in smaller spaces, so um, you can have songs that yappity dappity da, they can be rat tat tat, they can be the kind of patter songs or the kind of very, very witty songs um, uh, that, that Larry Hart wrote, um, or that Cole Porter did, or Ira Gershman. Or um, any of those wonderful early writers, um, and that would suggest a certain kind of a writing at the piano. My grandfather was an incredibly fine pianist, which people don't really know. There's some recordings out there, which I recommend, uh, that show that. I mean, Gershwin rushed, rushed like crazy. I mean, he wasn't, I mean, he's impressive. I mean, he was probably the only composer my grandfather was envious of for very good reason, but, um, and Porter Rush, my grandfather had the time of a, he was unbelievable with the keyboard, and that was all from his time with Larry Hart, just an incredible pianist. Um, uh, so musicals can be in a small house, and you can, you can write songs like that. Operas can't sound like that. Um, Gilbert and Sullivan, we're not in enormous houses. I mean, you can't have how beautifully blue the sky and glasses rise up very high. Until you find a whole bunch you can't do that in an enormous house. Um, uh, you have to have a sort of mid-sized house, hence operetta. Um, and uh, then with opera, you have these 
very metaphorical ideas, um, and the vowels are very, very long extended. You have to lift them up and over and into these houses, which are enormous, with really long reverb times. The difference between musical and opera is, is at least in a large part of my view, has to do with how big the spaces are that they get sung into. So back to your question, um, the stuff you wrote with Hammerstein was a bit more operatic in that way, and by that I mean the ideas had a longer line, more lyrical and more, the vowels were more stretched, you know, to begin with. Thank you. <clears throat> Last chance. Any, any other questions? Well, this has been magical for me. I hope me for everyone else, and we thank you from the bottom of our heart. Nothing shy about shy. That's delicious. <laughs>